All right, welcome all. So we saw yesterday a very wonderful algorithm with the number of restrictions. Uh, we saw that max flow or min cut that this formulation gives us exact map inference for binary pairwise MRFs with submodular potentials. And this is very nice, but of course we want to go beyond. So today we will look at generalizations. We will go beyond binary by looking at the so-called Ishikawa construction. And this has been invented independently uh, at least twice. There's also uh, work by Sonka and co-authors along the same lines. Uh, this will allow us to do exact inference if the potential obeys a specific form. Um, then we will look at move-making algorithms in particular at alpha expansion and we will also address this limitation of submodularity by looking at algorithms which in computer vision are called QPBO. So here's the plan for today. That was too fast. Here's the plan for today. So uh, first for this Ishikawa construction this was work, uh, really important work that Ishikawa did during his PhD at the Courant Institute in New York. He was a mathematician, or he is a mathematician. And it allows us to solve in the map sense exactly multi label MRFs. So MRFs in which the random variables can have more than just the states 0 or 1. With, however, we have a certain restriction on the nature of the potentials. With potentials that need to be convex over a linearly ordered set. So when we work in segmentation or in semantic segmentation, uh, there is not necessarily a linear ordering. So if I want to uh, annotate a scene and say which part of it is uh, grass and which part of it is plain and which part of it is tarmac, there is not necessarily a natural ordering of these labels. In other situations, like when we uh, work in stereo, there is a natural ordering, namely, let's say we look at the depth. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the first class of labels I described, they are categorical, and the second class is ordinal. We have some ordering, and now we demand furthermore, here we, if we work with discrete labels, um, that this function be convex. So for example, I'm now going to draw these as continuous lines just for convenience. But really, this is discrete. Yeah? So really, I should only show what the pairwise potential. So what I'm drawing here is what the pairwise potential looks like as a function. So let's say this is psi ij. And I'm here looking at how it behaves as a function of xi minus xj. And here I'm plotting xi minus xj, so 0 is here. And really, I should only show these discrete values. But because it's a bit con more convenient to look at, I'm, I'm drawing, uh, I'm tracing this continuous line. Okay, So if I'm taking the absolute difference, this would be convex. Or if I'm taking uh, a parabola here, this would be convex, 
or if I'm taking a line which is linear but with a slope that increases over distance that would also be convex so all of these are convex um, they have in common that you can see the bottom of the pit from wherever you stand on the curve okay so if I'm putting a let's say a small a hiker here I'm really bad at drawing but if I'm putting a small hiker uh, on my parabola that hiker can see the pit of the parabola or the bottom of the parabola wherever she stands and the same is true for any of these blue potentials now this is you know for you to remember qualitatively if you like it uh, quantitatively um, you can think of for continuous functions uh, the curvature having to be positive uh, or non-negative everywhere or if we are talking about discrete labels like we have here then the second order finite differences need to be positive throughout and so on okay so those would be examples of positive potential or of convex potentials and let me give a counter example if I'm taking for example uh, the parabola and then I'm truncating it at some point so this is also called the truncated L2 norm and you will remember this from eons ago when we were discussing nonlinear filters it seems like half an eternity to me um, this would be an example of a function that is not convex and we are so this construction here works only for convex priors and Ishikawa found out how we can use graph cuts using an ingenuous construction which I'm going to show you now so I'm going to draw the tiny example uh, that he also has in his paper namely uh, only four random variables and three possible states per random variable so four random variables and three states each and I'm now replicating these random variables I'm replicating these four random variables three times because I have three possible states and now we want to uh, obtain a labeling which is given in terms of a cut in this space so I can introduce a source node s and a sink or target t and I'm now constructing a flow graph not unlike the one we've seen yesterday uh, let me use different colors now let's say I'm using here um, green For, uh, to express my unaries so if I draw it in factor graph notation then I have four random variables and I have a smoothness prior or factor between each pair in this tiny chain and I have these unaries Okay, this, so this is a one-dimensional graphical model, but the same construction works. If you have two dimensions, only it becomes harder to, to draw. Okay, and now I want to express first um, where I want to cut. And I, I should make these first ones here green also, excuse me. Um,
because I have three possible states and uh, depending on the capacities I am giving these uh, green arrows I will then obtain cuts in different possible places for example this cut here um, excuse me I'm going to correct this let's say because I you know I put the green color here so let's say uh, it if I'm looking only um, well so the green arrows tell me where I should introduce this cut okay now there are certain things we want to rule out for example I do not want to obtain a cut which uh, looks like this so the or let's say a cut which looks like this um, the problem with this kind of cut is that I don't get a unique label for every vertex uh, I don't get a unique label for every random variable so I want to prohibit this uh, I want to disallow my cut to turn back on itself I want to disallow it cutting this edge here and in order to disallow this I'm going to introduce these constraint edges which have and I'm going to endow them with an infinite capacity so the red ones are constrained capacities which are infinite and in green we have these capacities which express what unaries I prefer so these uh, green ones they encode the unaries and they are of course finite and this construction now disallows cuts like the, the fat red one that I had indicated here okay uh, so far so good but uh, we have not yet uh, taken into account that we have these smoothness factors here okay to be I'm usually a very monochrome person but I'm trying to be didactical here so I'm going to paint the unaries in green and now we still have these blue smoothness factors and I need to somehow encode them in the graph so let's say if, for example that we want to have a potential which increases linearly with the label difference So here we only have uh, three possible labels, so I can only have label differences up to two actually in this tiny example. So how can I augment my graph to include these energies? If you remember what we did yesterday, we can introduce horizontal edges exactly. So I'm going to have blue edges here and there and there and so on. And 
if I am giving each of these edges, let's say, a unit capacity, then, for example, if I am considering uh, this cut here, then I have a transition from label 1 to label 3 and I have uh, I can count how many edges did I cross or did I cut namely uh, an outgoing edge from the source here an outgoing edge there uh, so these were I, I paid two units because my label jumped or increased by by two okay and you know I'm I'm sorry, I'm going to make one correction after all, because yesterday I said that we always assign a point to either, it doesn't really matter, you know, we assign, I need some convention of what do I consider as label one, so the, the way I showed the convention here is that uh, the first render would be in state one and the last one would be in state three. I would have preferred if I had colored the ones in the bottom in black and the ones in top in green, but uh, you know I think it works like this also. Okay, good. So um, this is how we can construct a potential that increases linearly with uh, with label distance, and if we want it to increase super linearly then I need to introduce more of these yellow arrows. Okay, And uh, the red ones were used to restrict ourselves to unique labelings. Now this was for a one-dimensional Markov random field. You know, this was just a chain. And really, of course, uh, in image processing, we want to do this with uh, two-dimensional MRFs. So uh, if we think of the stereo problem, then uh, I'm trying to make a 3D sketch here. Maybe it's best for you to wait a moment, see if it works out. So this would be um, X and Y, and here we have depth. Now I can introduce my source node somewhere here and I connect my source node to every pixel here in this first plane and on the other side I have a sink to which every pixel uh, in this last plane is connected. In this cube itself I have the kind of construction that we have seen uh, above, except that it's a, three, a 3D construction, not a 2D construction. And then I will, in the end, obtain a cut in this volume. And this cut that I'm getting out in this uh, volume here will be, will directly be the, the depth surface that I'm estimating in a stereo problem. Okay, so the example here would be stereo, and the cut would correspond to my depth surface estimate, and the volume that uh, that is used to construct this graph is the cost volume. And so we have for each pixel position x and y, we have a choice of possible depths. And uh, from the disparity estimate, we get an estimate for how good each particular depth is. Okay. Any questions? Yes. I have one question concerning the convexity condition. Is there an easy way to explain why this has to hold? Because when we think of a function that is non-convex, for example, where the slope decreases mm -hmm. for uh, yep. distance of two, then we could just use a different um, loss for the arrows, the blue arrows that are in the upper part of the graph, and not use unit uh, 
Um, no, because uh, it has to. So it would be easy to do it if we knew what state we are in for a particular random variable. But it has to hold for all possible states that you could be in. So let's say um, you always want the increment uh, uh, to be one for the first label difference. But just you know, let's you know maybe let's even say let's even say zero for the second label difference. Okay. Um, but because I want an increment of one for the first label difference, I need an arrow of capacity one everywhere. And I am not allowed to use negative capacities, and uh, hence uh, this limitation. Yeah? So I cannot model diminishing returns with this kind of construction. I can only uh, model linear, which so the absolute value function is the least convex function you can get. It's the limiting case. Uh, to make it you know steeper or grow faster than absolute value is possible with this construction to make it grow slower like the square root or truncated or so on it's not possible more questions so I like it a lot it's a very nice construction you know somewhat limited by this thing here and indeed stereo is a good example because we want our depth estimates to be robust so yes we want to regularize we want to get rid of all the noise in our depth estimate but we do want to allow for true depth edges so let's say if I have a natural scene um, and then you know I have whatever a car and then it's quite natural uh, to have a depth jump at the at the limit of the car. Yeah? So let's say the car is close to me and then the building behind is far away so I want to have a depth jump in there and if I use something like a quadratic smoothing potential I will blur this depth edge. So I want to use robust potentials and this is unfortunately not possible with the construction that you have seen here which you know is that it's not possible is unsurprising because uh, solving multi-label Markov random fields in general is an NP-hard problem and here we have a polynomial time algorithm and we cannot you know hope to solve every problem in this in this class exactly any more questions all right Then I want to move on uh, to the next case. So we, we've done the Ishikawa. And now we're going to look at multi-label MRFs um, with more general potentials. However, uh, our solution is only going to be approximate. So we're looking at pairwise multi-label MRFs, no matter whether submodular or not. And we're now looking at approximate map solutions. And I am now So there are a couple of algorithms uh, that fall into this class. Uh, very famous ones are so-called alpha expansion or beta swap. And they, plus quite a few others, are subsumed in an algorithm called fusion moves. And this is a paper by Lempitsky and co-authors in Pami 2010. And I'm going to give you the intuition first. So 
what this algorithm does in generality is, is the following. Um, here an example is shown uh, for the estimation of optical flow. <coughs> for a Markov random field, optical flow is a very hard problem because uh, in optical flow estimation, I try to say for each and every pixel where it goes in the next image, if I have an image sequence. And because each pixel could go, could have an offset in both X and Y, I have a very large label space. So I'm, you know, in, in foreground background segmentation, I have two labels. In depth estimation, I have 10 labels. But in optical flow, I easily have hundreds of labels. So it, it is a massive problem. And uh, this is a figure giving you this intuition behind the fusion moves algorithm. Shown here is uh, the final result, which is a good looking flow. And we also know that it's uh, because there is some ground truth available, we know that this is uh, a very good optical flow. Uh, color coded here, you see both the direction in terms of the hue and then the uh, amount of flow or how far the shifts are in terms of the saturation. And this final solution has been constructed by taking the best of, of two worlds repeatedly. So here we have one kind of optical flow estimate which is very nice and smooth and it also um, propagates information to areas where we have little texture. However, as you can see, it blurs everything. And so here, for example, we have uh, two small figures and, you know, they're blurred completely. Here, on the other hand, we have a complementary uh, optical flow estimation algorithm, which gives a very noisy result. However, it's quite crisp. So if you can see these figures again here, they are actually preserved nicely. And also, if you look at the edges of objects, you know, here I have nice, uh, crisp boundaries, which are completely gone in the smooth solution. And in fusion moves, um, we now take these two candidate solutions and then decide in each and every pixel uh, which of the solutions we want to use. And the trick is to formulate this again as a graph cut optimization problem. And now uh, here is a naive way of fusing, which gives okayish results. Uh, this has, in terms of the auxiliary random field that we're setting up and trying to solve, it has a so it has an energy which is much, much lower than the energy of either of the candidate solutions, but it is uh, a lot higher than the energy being constructed here using the algorithm that I will show you in a minute, which is this one. Okay, so this is the result of uh, iteration one, and this is the result of iteration, I don't know, a thousand or something. Yeah? So where we repeatedly um, take the current best estimate and then improve it or offer it to exchange part of itself with an alternative solution uh, so as to iteratively improve the overall thing. Um, the black and white figure here, by the way, shows you which of the two solutions was used. So, for example, uh, if it's white, it means we used this solution if it's black, it means we used the smooth solution. And, ah, and I've explained something wrongly because the first iteration result seems to be this one here. Yeah? This is apparently iteration one. Okay, and then uh, the other one uh, comes from more frequent iterations. Okay, so here is the intuition, and now let's see in a bit more detail how this works. Uh, I'm going to look at the specific case of alpha expansion, which is maybe 
the most expense, uh, the most popular move making algorithm. And this is a Boykov 2001 paper. So in alpha expansion, we do the following. We allow each node in our graphical model to either keep the current label or switch to some label which we have randomly selected alpha okay so let's say if our application is stereo then we would have a current depth image and now we ask each and every pixel if it wants to retain its current depth or if it prefers uh, switching to a depth of alpha which perhaps is uh, you know, chosen to be three. And then I ask this question of every pixel, I obtain a new solution, and then I play the same game again, but using a different alpha, for example, a depth of five, and so on. Yeah, so I need to iterate this multiple times. Now, we need to make this decision of do we want to stick with the old solution or switch to the new one, and this is a problem that we again set up as a Markov random field. So we set up a new, a new problem. We are given some current labeling X and we are given potentials psi, then we define a set of new variables y, binary variables, I either set it to zero meaning I keep the current label and I create a new unary potential which I call phi or I allow my new binary variable to be one which means that in this node I'm now switching to label alpha And then the cost of this is psi i of alpha. So psi was the original potential of my original MRF and phi is the new potential that I'm creating. Excuse me. Yeah. No, uh, we use the same alpha for every pixel, but a different alpha in every iteration. Yes, precisely. Yeah. Um, so same alpha for all the nodes in the graphical model, and a different alpha. In different iterations and often it is just randomly selected the next alpha that we want to use okay so those were the unaries and now I need to define also new pairwise potentials
So the contribution to the energy function that I get by keeping both pixels or keeping both labels is just this. Do you have another question or comment? Okay. If we change both labels to alpha, then this incurs a cost of psi ij alpha alpha. If I let uh, I have its old label, excuse me, sorry, um, then here I get psi ij of xi and alpha. And if I let the other one switch to alpha and keep <coughs> The original label in the second <laughs> node, then I pay psi ij of <coughs> alpha and xj. Good. Now, if I want my new yes question, um, we choose alpha randomly, okay, and we do this multiple times. So and then I can set up a new energy function and this looks exactly like the energy function we wrote down yesterday except uh, we wrote yesterday we had psi instead of phi and x instead of y. But the i and j in the second sum are coupled. Yeah, it's uh, if there, if there is a pairwise potential between the two. Is this not a constraint anymore for our um, graph? No, it is a so, um, you know, this is for all sets i and j which share a pairwise potential, and uh, I'm sometimes omitting this tilde because I can simply say, uh, all pairwise potentials of non-adjacent nodes are set to zero. Okay. Good. Now, yesterday we saw a great tool to solve this kind of energy minimization problem exactly if the following condition was fulfilled. Uh, if we have submodularity, so if phi ij of 0, 0 plus phi ij of 1, 1 is no more than <coughs> phi ij of 0, 1 plus phi ij of 1, 0. Okay, and now we want this to be true so that we can solve this problem efficiently using graph cut or max flow min cut. And now this translates to some conditions on psi. So this statement here is uh, true if the following conditions hold. So if psi ij of alpha alpha is zero, because so it means uh, this term here is zero, um, then in addition I want symmetry, so psi ij of alpha beta should be psi ij of beta alpha. And thirdly, I want to impose the triangle inequality. So if psi ij of xi and xj is no more than psi ij, the difference between xi and alpha. And now using the symmetry condition, I can say plus psi ij of alpha and xj, excuse me. Good, and if you look at these um, three conditions together, 
then uh, what it tells me is that this term here is zero and this and then I have written on the left hand side that psi i j x i x j is less than I'm looking up the definitions here psi i j of x i alpha plus psi i j of alpha x j and this is the same statement uh, that we had written down here so um, if these uh, three statements hold, then uh, this condition uh, at the bottom, this submodularity condition, on phi holds. Okay, so um, the submodularity of phi is true if psi is a metric, because uh, these conditions here, one, two, three. Um, they are a de these are the definition of these are the characterizing properties of a metric okay. so bottom line is if psi is a metric potential then the alpha then a single iteration of alpha expansion can be solved to optimality using min cut or max flow. However, this is just a statement about a single iteration, and the procedure as a whole is only an approximate procedure. It is approximate. But it actually has some certificate, meaning that uh, if we uh, run this to uh, convergence, then the energy can be no worse than the optimal energy multiplied by a factor of, uh, I believe, two. Uh, I would have to look up the exact number. Okay. So the entire procedure is approximate, but empirically. pretty good. And I want to show you some images from this paper that have become quite iconic. So um, the this is again the name of the paper and these are the images and let's look at those iconic meaning you've seen those images in literally thousands of talks uh, uh, in the last few years so we have some current uh, labeling alpha uh, excuse me a this would be the current labeling then uh, shown in B is another move making strategy uh, in this case uh, if we use a procedure called iterated conditional modes we look at each and every pixel in turn and ask whether it would like to change its label yeah, so we start scanning on the top left and ask this pixel would it like to change its label and then we ask uh, or we do this in a random order then we ask some other pixel would it like to change its label and some other pixel and so on and so uh, per iteration in ICM we can only change one pixel at a time here on the right is the result from alpha expansion uh, 
um, which allows a large number of pixels to change its opinion about what they want to be in a single move. Okay, so this is here a single move and the move itself has been found optimally using this graph cut construction. However, uh, there may be many moves required to come to an optimal solution of this multi-label, of this NP-hard multi-label MRF problem. Um, in the same paper, there are actually two procedures being proposed. One of them is the alpha expansion that we just discussed. Uh, another one is the alpha-beta swap which asks, um, so in alpha beta swap, for example, we disregard everything that is not labeled alpha or beta, and we only ask those pixels labeled alpha or beta if they want to exchange their labels or if they want to stay with what they are. And then we do this multiple times, so once we do it with alpha beta, and uh, then we do it with uh, the same game with alpha and gamma, and so on. Um, but generally, alpha expansion seems to work a little bit better, and this is what people tend to use more. And both of these strategies, alpha expansion and uh, alpha beta swap, are just specific instances of this more general idea of taking two solutions, which in the case of alpha expansion would be our current estimate, and another label image which has alpha written on every pixel and taking the best possible compromise or the, the best from these both worlds and then doing this multiple times. Now if we um, if this property does not hold, if psi is not a metric then the problem is not submodular so we want to have an algorithm that allows us to deal with non-submodular binary pairwise MRFs, which is something we will come to after the break. But before that, I want to know if you have any more questions. Yes? Um, so every move itself is optimal, but there is no... You see, there is already the question, what is the sequence of moves? So which alpha do I use in the first iteration, which alpha do I use in the next iteration, and so on. And it can accidentally happen but that it will end up in a global optimum, but we have no guarantee, unfortunately. Um, in terms of energy, yes. Um, there is the certificate that I mentioned, which I believe is a factor of two, that uh, we are at most away from the optimum. In practice it works much better. In practice we get pretty good approximations, as we know by comparing to ILP solutions. More questions? Okay, um, yeah, one more? The, the first picture we saw in this paper, the one with these two persons standing there, is this a video or was this just an image? Um, so where, where this experiment comes from? This. Yeah. Um, this is an experiment from the famous Middlebury database. And um, these, the authors of this benchmark acquired a video of things moving, so uh, the colors tell you in which direction things are moving, and um, they uh, spray painted all objects with a random pattern which was not visible to the, uh, well, which you cannot see in, in the visible range, so that normal cameras cannot see it, but they used in addition, 
a special channel or special camera that did allow to acquire this uh, fine texture and that allowed you to uh, produce a ground truth estimate of what the true the truly true uh, motion is and uh, then you can give uh, then you can you know specify your error relative uh, to this ground truth um, so this is one way of obtaining uh, measured ground truth uh, an alternative is that people try and simulate data but it turns out to be very difficult to um, come up with a simulation that is as hard as reality so in, in, uh, in real life you have all kinds of you know specularities and this and that which is uh, difficult to model reliably so there is a nice website here where you have the data sets and where you have a leaderboard so you know which algorithm is, is how good and then you see on a couple of sequences uh, what is the average rank of a what is the average rank of a method the image we looked at was called you know that was the army sequence in this case and then you see here different error measures uh, how well a method does on different sequences and so on and you can see you know it's a very active uh, research area you know, not so not so easy to to beat the state of the art. <laughs> okay, let's have a break.